I want to begin by thanking the uh, organizers for this opportunity to uh, talk to you today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Global Lyme Alliance, and what I want to tell you about is how uh, our organization really focuses on patient priorities and how to bridge uh, the priorities that patients indicate to us and what we do as funders of Lyme and tick-borne disease research globally. Next slide. So just to provide a quick snapshot, uh, Global Lyme Alliance, or GLA, is entirely donor-supported. It's a 501c3 nonprofit that's dedicated to curing Lyme and other tick-borne diseases through support of innovative research, awareness, and empowering the patient voice. Uh, to date, we've committed uh, $19 million to support Lyme and other tick-borne disease research around the world. Uh, this has resulted in funding more than 70 different research projects at top academic and uh, hospital uh, institutions globally. Uh, this has generated over 170 publications in 90 different peer-reviewed medical and scientific journals. And what we're really focused on is supporting research to drive development of better diagnostic tools and alternative treatment options to really help post-treatment Lyme disease uh, syndrome patients and, and chronic Lyme patients. And if you look at this pie chart here, roughly 40% of our funding goes to basic research, but that basic research is very focused on expanding our knowledge base on how to develop better innovative diagnostics, innovative therapies, and then ultimately move into supporting clinical studies, uh, some of which are actually being conducted at the Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases Research Center uh, at Columbia University, which is directed by Dr. Brian Fallon. Next slide. So GLA just uh, completed uh, a rather lengthy process of developing a research strategic plan that builds upon what we've been doing over the past several years and really sets us up to directly address a patient priority. And that is to drive discovery of effective treatments for chronic Lyme patients. We do this through supporting the investigation of mechanisms underlying chronic Lyme disease, in particular, better understanding how Borrelia burgdorferi can survive uh, in the um, in the uh, in the exposure phase of antibiotics in individuals. We also support the research and development of diagnostics for early and chronic Lyme disease and ultimately are driving towards um, supporting research that explores treatments that both improve the quality of life of chronic Lyme patients while also seeking a cure. And our ability to uh, focus on these three areas of research support is built upon the partnerships that we've established to expand research opportunities and drive advances. And this, in turn, is supported by our efforts to strengthen scientific infrastructure, including the development of longitudinal biobanks. Next slide. So... How exactly do we drive discovery of effective treatments for chronic Lyme disease? Uh, it's a multi-step process. Uh, we continue to identify and support development of innovative diagnostics. We want to determine how to accurately diagnose chronic Lyme patients. And this use of that term, chronic Lyme patient, this is different from the post-treatment Lyme disease patients the research definition as described by Dr. Alcott earlier today. These chronic Lyme patients are individuals that are suffering from chronic symptomatology, persistent symptoms, but they potentially have this condition in the absence of a history of a tick bite, a history of an erythema migrans lesion, either bullseye or atypical, most often atypical, uh, specific symptoms consistent with Lyme disease, and a strict serological antibody-based evidence for Borrelia burgdorferi infection. Uh, 
But it's really important to try and figure out how to alter our thinking about how to identify and diagnose chronic Lyme patients because they need to be recruited into clinical studies. And the reason for doing that is we need to better understand what distinguishes a chronic Lyme patient from a patient that receives antibiotics and is essentially uh, cured for all intents and purposes. Once we do that and have a better understanding of what distinguishes chronic Lyme patients from the earlier phases of Lyme disease, we can then identify and support development of innovative treatments to be evaluated, and that will be done in the context of recruiting chronic Lyme patients into clinical trials. Next slide. So what we're focused on now is looking for several different eggs in one basket. Uh, as I suggested, the challenge is determining whether a patient has Lyme disease despite an absence of current consensus clinical or diagnostic evidence. We think the way to do this is to employ composite diagnostic testing. We've heard a lot about this uh, today in other talks, using a combination of uh, unique Borrelial signatures, looking for uh, direct evidence of Borrelial proteins, nucleic acids, bacterial metabolites in an individual, coupling that with an analysis of genetic and or epigenetic signatures that might distinguish a chronic Lyme patient from patients uh, with earlier phases of Lyme disease or other chronic uh, uh, associated illnesses. Host metabolomic signatures, inflammation signatures. Uh, you heard earlier by uh, Dr. Uh, Ray uh, Datweiler's um, presentation that uh, Diasorin is developing a diagnostic test that actually couples use of Borrelia specific interferon gamma responses along with uh, IgM and IgG responses to shorten the window of opportunity for clinicians to actually diagnose Lyme disease as early as possible, literally within the first seven to 10 days post uh, tick-mediated transmission of Borrelia. Cellular signatures, we've heard a lot from uh, Dr. Chu and others, uh, the power of using single cell RNA sequence analysis to discriminate different patient populations. And then also moving away from a sole serological focus on antibodies that are raised against Borrelia proteins, looking at T cell independent antibody signatures as well. So the body's ability to produce antibodies against Borrelia glycolipids or phospholipids. Next slide. So what we're hoping is this type of very comprehensive and uh, diverse approach will allow us to get a better handle on Lyme disease patient landscape. We're relatively clear on how to diagnose and treat Lyme disease patients stages one through three, early, early disseminated and late. But when those individuals uh, fail to respond favorably to antibiotic treatment. Uh, they can become post-treatment Lyme disease patients, uh, which is equivalent to chronic Lyme disease. But there's actually a much larger population of individuals that don't meet that current consensus definition of chronic Lyme disease. So this leaves us with a question, both from a research perspective and from a clinical treatment perspective, do these individuals actually have chronic Lyme disease or are they suffering from some other infection associated chronic illness? Next slide. Ultimately, we believe that success in winning the war against chronic Lyme disease really requires that we bridge the gap between IDSA and ILANS. In both cases, we've worked very closely with colleagues on both ends of the spectrum. And to an individual, everyone wants to help these patients that are suffering from chronic symptomatology. That is their goal. No one disbelieves that they aren't chronically ill. There are differences in how they want to approach helping those patients, but I think building off of that consensus desire to help patients, we need to provide critical resources to advance science and leverage partnerships between Lyme treating physicians, academia, industry, and government to really win this war against chronic Lyme disease and help these patients. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.